It's day 7 of the movement control order in Malaysia, and since we're not supposed to be outside, I have finished all 7 hours and 22 minutes of Philip Bloom's filmmaking for photographers course, the perfect way to practice social distancing. It was a bit of a wake-up call for me, because it was an in-depth course on the art of filmmaking without involving large expensive cinema cameras, since it was filmmaking for photographers, hence you could do it with any stills camera that records video. A great reminder for me to pay more attention to actual film language than how many stops of dynamic range my camera has. So freshly inspired from watching the course, here are three things I've picked up from the course that can make your footage look more cinematic, regardless of what you're shooting on. This video is sponsored by MZ, the very online education platform that brought us the Filmmaking for Photographers course. The first thing to take note of for more cinematic looking video is ironically something that cannot be seen, and that is audio. You might say that it doesn't make sense because audio has nothing to do with how things look, but many filmmakers would agree that good audio is at least as important as, if not even more important than good visuals, because bad audio has the power to make a video downright unwatchable. If your video contains dialogue, for example this talking head right now, you could spend a lot of effort making sure that it looks good, but if the dialogue sounds bad, it kind of ruins everything. You're so distracted by the bad audio, you won't bother how great things look. Inversely speaking, your visuals could look not so good, but if the dialogue sounds clean, then I would say there is a higher chance that people are still going to sit through it compared to something that's well lit, but sounds bad. You should also consider doing Foley, which is going back and recording little sound effects up close. You would be surprised at how much it elevates and complements the visuals of a scene. For example, here's a sequence without Foley. And here it is again, with. Cool thing about Foley is you might not even have to recreate the sound using the original object. For example, in my video about buying used lenses, to recreate the sound of grit grinding inside a lens's focus ring, I simply recorded grains of salt getting rubbed between my fingers. There's a demonstration of an entire Foley session in the first module of Philip's course, so if you're planning on getting the course, definitely look out for that. At number two is the lighting. For me, lighting is everything. It is an extremely powerful tool and is very commonly overlooked. It most definitely pays off to spend some time understanding how light works because how well the lighting is executed will have a massive impact on the production value of your image. Lighting is really a lot more than just raising up the overall exposure of your image. For example, in terms of light placement, the further off to the side your key light is, the more it's going to drag out those shadows and create a more dramatic high contrast look. Now here I'm not really going into a lot of detail because it would be impossible for me to properly explain a good coverage of lighting theory in a short video like this. Instead, what I'm trying to say is, get Philip's course because there's a whole in-depth module on lighting. Okay, what I'm really trying to say is, when you start paying detailed attention to lighting, it will entirely change the way you shoot and your approach to visually constructing a shot. And that applies to shooting with natural light as well. Although you have less control over natural light, it will still affect your placement of your camera and subject in relation to the sun. Now, I would love to demonstrate that for you, but right now in Malaysia, it is literally illegal to be filming outside during the control order, so I'm just gonna pull some clips from Philip's course. Here is a shot where the sun is directly behind the camera, illuminating the talent head on, but check out what it looks like when we flip this around so the sun is backlighting the subject and it looks amazingly flattering. There's this glowing edge separating the subject from the background and there's a great contrast overall, making the second image look much more cinematic in comparison to the first. So once you get familiar with lighting theory, you can make lighting decisions based on your own judgement because there is no one-size-fits-all formula to effective and beautiful lighting. A few of the main grounds to cover for lighting are which direction your light source is coming from, how intense is the light and how the light is falling off, how soft is your light and that has to do with the relative size of your light source, and finally the colour of your light. Now the final tip, and arguably one of the most important tips here for cinematic looking footage, is movement. We have to understand that movement is the main factor that differentiates filmmaking and stills photography. Now there are two kinds of movement we're talking about here, 
camera movement, and movement within the frame. When talking about camera movement, there are so many ways to move your camera, and each type of move, when motivated, can bring added meaning or enhance the storytelling capabilities of a shot. Motivated means there is a reason behind the move, for example, pushing in using a slider or a dolly to give the feeling of getting emotionally closer to our subject, or pulling back to feel that we're just gonna leave the character to it, so we're distancing ourselves away, like we all should be doing right now. Sometimes it's also perfectly okay to use unmotivated camera moves just to give a shot so that would otherwise look overly static and bland, some dynamic visual appeal to it. It can make things look more aesthetic, a very common technique for commercial looking product shots. And that second type of movement that we mentioned about is movement within the frame. Now, if there's a shot that has nothing moving in it, even though you're rolling at 24 frames per second, it's still going to look like a still photo. Having at least something that is moving within the frame makes all the difference. In film school, we were taught that these moving elements within the frame were part of what was known as the mise-en-scene, and it is a quintessential element to good filmmaking. Mise-en-scene directly translates to put in scene, so it refers to everything that is included in that composition of yours. So this movement within the frame is especially useful to keep in mind when you find yourself having to shoot a scene where there is not much going on, your camera may be locked off on a tripod, think of what movement you can try to introduce to a scene. It's going to make it look much more cinematic when there's at least one moving element. So those three tips were based off of the Filmmaking for Photographers course, but this is definitely not one of those I watched it so you don't have to videos, simply because there is so much content packed into those seven and a half hours. And in light of the current global situation, MZ is actually donating 20% of all their sales this month and possibly even longer to the LA Regional Food Bank to help those who have taken the hardest hit from the outbreak. So for each purchase of the Filmmaking for Photographers course, that is 160 meals donated to the underprivileged. There's a lot more knowledge taught in the course to add on to the three things that we covered today, like tips for recording cleaner dialogue outdoors, how to light for moving subjects, a breakdown on each type of tool used for camera movement, and a ton of other useful stuff to know, like a comprehensive explainer on digital imaging, how to structure a sequence, the 180 degree rule and how to break it, how to edit, and we also get a whole lesson where we follow Philip through his process of shooting two projects. That was an interesting one because in that lesson, he shares some truly invaluable tips coming from his experience on the topic of working with clients. If you have never worked with clients before and see yourself doing so in the future, he gives some seriously good advice in that module. You don't charge for it, you just do it on spec and it gives you a calling card, it gives you something to show other clients who will hopefully will pay you to make one of these videos. And for some reason, there are four entire lessons out of the six in the course that were shot inside a literal castle. You can get the course from mz.com, I'll leave a link below. And even though they did sponsor this video, I'm saying this as my own opinion, I think that the course is worth every penny given the amount of effort that Philip has put into making it and the amount of knowledge that he's packed into it. So that's it for today, I'll see you in my next video. Until then, here's some of my other videos.